scripture passages and readings for this week, I found myself less than thrilled. Honestly, our parable for today has to be one of the most difficult passages to understand and rightly interpret, and certainly one of the most difficult to preach on. For me personally, this particular parable always seems to raise more questions than it answers. So needless to say, I immediately knew that I would this week be relying on the reflections and knowledge of others. That is to say, I went straight to the commentaries, hoping they might assist me in getting a better handle on the text itself and maybe even helping me to kind of get a direction for this week's message. Though not always necessary, pastors to take comfort in knowing that there are those resources available to us whenever we might find ourselves kind of stuck on any particular passage. So I went to my bookshelf, I began to pull out all the books that I had pertaining to this particular text, and I began reading, waiting for that aha moment when things just seemed to come together and all is made clear. And I kept reading. And I kept waiting, but that moment never came. In fact, the authors of these books seem to raise the very same questions I had. One author pointed out that most preachers are smart just to pass over this text and maybe pick another one to preach on. Another author, author actually suggested that the Apostle Luke himself had no idea what to do with this parable. For what do we make of a manager who is commended for his dishonesty, commended for using dishonest wealth and gain to make friends. So here I was facing a text that I really had no idea of what to make of it, and I found myself becoming somewhat frustrated. Frustrated because, you see, I really kind of was depending on those commentaries. I was frustrated because this time, the very thing I have learned to turn to, the very thing I learned that I can rely on in times like these, well, it just wasn't there for me. And in the midst of my frustration and mental block, I began to wonder if this isn't actually the lesson in the parable. The manager was commended because he planned ahead. The manager was commended because he came to realize that those things he was able to rely upon up to that point, and throughout his life and his own career, those same things weren't going to be there for him in the future. Here was a man facing a very critical point in his life. He knew he was going to lose his job, his security, his livelihood. And to make matters worse, the manager also realized he didn't have anything to fall back on. After reading the verses, we can surmise that this manager probably wasn't some 30-year-old guy who could just simply go out and find another job. His options seemed to be somewhat limited. They were limited on account of his physical strength and abilities. And now a man who had once been filled with pride who could at one time rely completely on himself, faced the real likelihood of having to bed. And the solution he came up with is quite amazing. And sometimes I think it's easy for us to overlook it because many of us have planned ahead. Many of us are planning for our futures. Whether it's the savings accounts, the 401k, the stocks, whatever it is, looking ahead and planning for the future doesn't really seem to be all that unique and idea worthy of praise. Yet I couldn't help but think how different this man's response was from our own. For you see, our plans for our future often include the simple goal of accumulating more of the very thing that we know doesn't last. To continue to accumulate the very thing that will inevitably fail us sooner or later. This man knew that there was something more secure, something more lasting. When his earthly possessions would fail him, the solution wouldn't be more of it. When he couldn't rely on himself anymore, 
He would rely on the mercy of others. You see, the amazing part of this parable is this idea, this truth, that one's earthly life, those possessions we so often describe as belonging to this world, they can be used to produce spiritual things. They can be used in this world and in our lifetime for the kingdom of God. But I wonder if this is really the way we often think of our lives. That the possessions we have, those possessions we have been given and charged with, or even our own individual strengths and gifts and talents, our business sense, our technological skills, our ability to communicate, whatever it might be for each of us individually, do we ever see how those things, how our daily lives can be used to produce things that endure? Do we ever consider using those very things to benefit the kingdom of God? That our Monday through Friday life isn't separate and apart from our life of faith? Notice for this man that required him not just to look to something new and different, but to look to someone. He would rely upon the mercy and love of others. His security would no longer come through something he could control, something he could manipulate, something he could earn, but in the free will of those who had their debts forgiven. And that is where the parable ends. In other words, we don't know what happens to this man. We don't know whether or not his plan actually worked out. Though many might read this parable and comfortably assume that's what happened, that these people welcomed him into their home and took care of him, I was drawn to the fact that the parable actually never comes to that. You kind of have to wonder if this man would later receive from those whose debts were forgiven, the very things he needed for his life. So I began to consider the untold part of this story. Those unnamed characters who experienced one of the greatest surprises of their life. Those who maybe for the first time in their lives learned what it felt like to receive a gift that would change their very lives. To be freed from the debts they owed. And I began to think maybe this is actually who we are in America. Those people. For each of us here today have received a gift. The gift of being freed from our own debts. Forgiven of those things God could certainly hold against us. And for us who have experienced this gift, experienced that weight being lifted from us, we know it's greater than being released from any mortgage or financial burdens. It is a gift that reminds us in that moment what is truly important in life. It reminds us of what is important and what is lasting. Maybe the parable didn't end because it's still being told. It's being told today in your life and in mine. As children of God who have been freed from our debts and those things that have weighed us down, have we shown mercy and kindness to those around us? As those who have been forgiven, do we reciprocate that same mercy to those who have sinned against us? Scripture tells us to store up treasures in heaven. And today we learn that sometimes we are called to store up treasures by giving it to another by entrusting it to another. That is, in our exchanges between one another, that is, through our earthly lives and possessions, mercy and compassion continue to live out. God certainly entrusted to us the greatest treasure of all, the most precious gift He could have ever given. It wasn't our earthly possessions, it was something that was much closer to Him he has entrusted His Son to us. He has entrusted that message of love and forgiveness. A love that was demonstrated through the life, death, and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He entrusted it to us 
the moment His Spirit came to rest upon us and in us through the waters of holy baptism. He entrusted it to us the moment we received His forgiveness, when our debts were paid by the one who owed none. And no matter where we find ourselves in life, no matter what needs we have, Christ continues to be the one thing we can always fall back on. His mercy, the one thing that will never fail us. And today, as Christ's disciples, we are reminded that we are now called upon to respond, to share that which God has invested and given to each of us. We are called to be merciful in our response to having been shown mercy, to be generous in response to having been given everything. We are called to take all that God has given to us, our earthly possessions, our unique gifts, and use them on earth to extend God's kingdom. For mercy is the one thing that lasts. Love is the one thing that endures. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.